everyone, it's uh, Frank Walters here and I'm the watercolour tutor at QArt Studio in West London. Um, I've been giving this accelerated introduction to watercolour painting course now for, for some time. Um, it's really constructive for people that want to learn how to paint in watercolour. It's over six sessions and it covers a, a multitude of areas. Um, getting started with the right brushes, paper and paint, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. It goes on to basic values, the three phases of painting. It talks about colour and temperature, the colour wheel, composition, uh, basic techniques like wet in wet and dry brush, etc. But I just want to concentrate on getting started with the right brushes, paper and paint. So let's do that. First of all, let's talk about brushes. Let me show you a brush that you might be familiar with. This. This is your typical sort of nylon, small nylon brush that comes with the first paint box that you're probably given. Um, it's usually a paint box with a bewildering amount of colours and this tiny little nylon brush which is really responsible uh, for not getting people off on the right foot because watercolour isn't all about detail it's about expression and to be really expressive you really need not this but you need something yeah. like this this is a kalinsky sable not necessarily a cheap brush it's a number 14 in this case but it's got a lovely fine point the sable holds lots of water and it keeps its shape really nicely um they are expensive, but you don't have to necessarily start off with a Kalinsky Sable. Uh, you could go out and pick something like this up, which is a synthetic Da Vinci. It does exactly the same job. You can see it's almost about the same size. The numbers are slightly different. This is a 14 round, but when you move away from the Sable brushes, sometimes the numbers change. So be careful there when you're ordering a brush. But this is perfectly good to start with. And you need something like this, a nice big mop style synthetic brush. You will need a bit of detail, but I really think this is far too small. So where do you go? Well, in terms of a Kalinsky Sable, you could go to something like this, which is a number eight Da Vinci. Again, a lovely size and it forms a fine point. So you will get control and you will get detail from this. Again fairly expensive so maybe pick up something like this. This is a Da Vinci Spin Synthetic which I've been using for a little while now. It's got a fine point. Hasn't got the quality that uh, the Kalinsky Sable has but it's still a good brush and I've been using it a lot especially on commissions so I would strongly advise uh, one of those. Finally, uh, I talked about a round brush. There are square brushes as well. Um, and square brushes are really good for, for cutting into shapes like painting windows and just getting hard edges. Also, the flat brush is nice for big washers. So, you know, it's, it's very good. It's very handy. And finally, while we're talking about brushes, how about a rigger? It's called a rigger because it was designed for painting the, the rigging of ships. It's a long brush. It holds, therefore, holds a lot of water and therefore it travels a long way. Travels a long way. So it's a bit like the painting the rigging of ships. It's good if you need some linear work. This little thing would never do it. So that's a little bit about brushes. Okay, right now uh, we have paper. Let's talk about paper. In essence, there are three types of watercolour paper. There's a, there's a thing called HP, which is hot press, and hot press is a very smooth paper. Smooth paper that is really ideal for detail work, but it's not really ideal for general landscape painting. That's not to say it isn't good because I've used hot press. Water travels very quickly across it, and sometimes you get some really quite nice techniques. I quite like it now and again, but I think the traditional area for painting is down here with knot, 
It's called knot. It's sometimes called cold press. Uh, and that has a tooth to it. And having a tooth is quite important, especially if you want some dry brush. You want the paint to break up slightly and give it texture. So this is really the ideal, the one in the middle, the cold press. You can go for rough, which is a much rougher version than the cold press. So it's these two, the knot, the cold press, or the rough is where you should be when you're looking at paper. Now you can buy paper like this. This is French, arch, fantastic, cold press, 140 pound, very important. Should never go less than 140 pound in terms of the thickness or the weight of the paper. A great British um, company is Saunders Waterford. That's what I use all the time. This one is rough and it's 140 pound. This comes in blocks and they're sealed together. You can see at the top, you just get a, you paint. And when you finished, it stays nice and flat. You can then put a knife in there and you can then, when it's finished, cut out the sheet. These uh, blocks can be a little bit expensive, but they're very good. There is another thing you could do. You could actually go out and buy sheets like this of Quarter Imperial Saunders Waterford, which has the logo, the stamp, the Waterford paper. And what you do is you can buy it in Quarter Imperial sheets. You can then either paint to this size or you can fold it over. And tear it down. They have deckled edges, which are, which are nice. Nice way of painting, nice way of presenting. So I'll just tear this. It is easy to tear, believe me. There you go. Here's one that I put down on a, a piece of card. And always tape your paper down on card or on board with masking tape nothing else. Uh, it's the best way. When you're painting it will start to cockle slightly when you put the first wash on but as it dries it starts to dry flat and this is I've tried many many different ways of doing it and using masking tape is the best way. It's also great because when you've finished you have a nice clean edge to your painting and sometimes you can allow that to show uh, when you have your work mounted which I'm sure you will do. So that's a little bit about paper. Right, okay, we've done brushes, we've done paper, and finally, let's talk about paint. Most important thing of all, um, where do we start? You remember I said earlier on about the bewildering array of colors that one gets with their first tin of uh, watercolor paints? Well, to be honest with you, uh, the best way of starting is starting with a a fairly minimal palette and I developed a minimal palette just for the purpose of this introduction of watercolour uh, course and the minimal palette is not something I've <laughs> made up it's based very much on the classic artists going right back to Turner uh, going back to John Singer Sargent some of the really great watercolourists um, uh, Edward Sego, um, etc. Um, so we're looking at colours and really a lot of those colours are divided into sky, earth and these things called CADs which stands for the cadmium, cadmium red, cadmium yellow and cadmium orange. Now one of the things that I do is that I tend to work here with this minimal set. I've got a little more than 12. I've, I have in fact 16 there. I have a, a couple of specials that I use now and again. But on the whole I stuck with this basic set of colours for some time. And I'll just go through them in just a little bit more, more detail. Um, if we, first of all, we look at our sky colours. Um, we start with indigo. Indigo is a fairly dark blue. 
you'll notice I don't have any blacks. If I want black, I'll, I'll might mix indigo with maybe a bit of burnt sienna, and that's how I'll get a very strong black. Um, indigo is quite a rich color, and it is fairly transparent, and it works in all sorts of places. It's a, just a good solid dark blue color to have, and it's cool. It's cool in terms of its temperature. The next one is French ultramarine. French ultramarine has always been a very important blue for me because it mixes really well, especially for things like shadows. You can mix French ultramarine um, with alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson, that's the one there, alizarin crimson by itself is far too rich, far too potent. But you can mix alizarin crimson with the blues to get really interesting purple colors and you use purple colors in things like shadows and so on finally the last one of the three sky colors is cerulean blue cerulean blue is the color of sky on a beautiful sunny day that's cerulean uh, cerulean is very opaque that's not necessarily a bad thing um, but cerulean is, is very good to have in the tin uh, of course there are other blues. Of course there's cobalt blue. Uh, there's Windsor blue. There are many blues out there. But for argument's sake, I get all my students just to start with those three. Having a limited palette is about colours complementing one another and understanding how colours work together. That's why it's good to start with just 12 colours. It's the best possible way. Over here we have the earth colours. I've mentioned the lizard in crimson, but here we have one of the most important colors of all, raw sienna. Uh, a lot of artists use yellow ochre, which is a very similar color, but I prefer raw sienna. I think it's more traditional and it goes really well with burnt sienna, which is its much stronger redder cousin. Burnt sienna itself is also very important and great for mixing grays. Sometimes you need those neutral colors and you need burnt sienna mixed with one of the blues to, to achieve a nice warm gray. Temperature is something else which is very important and that's why it's good keeping the, the colors down to a minimal. There's raw umber which is used. Um, again, you notice I use very few greens here. Raw umber is a great earth color that can be used for trees and foliage um, and it's it mixes beautifully and finally um, the earth colors uh, sepia sometimes called van dyke brown um, but again very strong very dark sepia uh, you mix sepia with indigo you'll get black but you can mix sepia also with other colors with maybe yellow uh, cad yellow to try and get lighter versions of, for foliage. Finally, there is one green at the bottom here, and that's olive green. And olive green is, to me, I think is one of the most natural looking greens. Greens are tough, actually. A lot of people think, you know, greens are easy. You just mix blue and yellow, don't you? Isn't that it? Not really. Greens can, if you don't get greens right, they can really mess up a landscape painting. So I always advise all my students to, to stick with olive green and then start adding elements of yellow or sienna or blue to the olive green to get richer or lighter variations of the green. So those are my colors and how do I use those colors? Well, here's my tin. This is the tin I always use, but I buy colors in tubes. There are two makes that I particularly like. Uh, there's Rembrandt, um, which are from Royal Tallins in, in Holland. Uh, they're lovely paints, and I've been using these for 30 years now. They're absolutely wonderful. This one is raw sienna. There's my raw sienna in the tin. And if I need to fill it up, that's what I do. I drop in some raw, raw sienna. This is the cheapest way of maintaining your colors. You can buy them uh, together in, 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 um, in little pads. You can buy them there, but I would really strongly advise you to, 
to buy these. Here's another one. This is Schmincke, a German company. Um, you will find, though, that manufacturers like Rembrandt and Schmincke and Daniel Smith and Winsor and & Newton and Sennelier, which is a French make, they all uh, have similar colours. They're all called raw sienna, but, uh, or they might all be called cerulean blue. But I can assure you that uh, one, the, the Schmincke cerulean blue is slightly different to the Rembrandt cerulean blue. So you've got to watch those things. But if you follow this, this rule of thumb, I think you will have the perfect amount of watercolour paints and colours and temperatures by which to really understand watercolour and really, really get you off on the right foot. So there it is. We've done um, brushes, paper and paint. I hope you found this useful and um, let's catch up again soon. Take care. Bye bye.